Another brandy for my guest, please, and a uh, barley water for the wee girl. I'm not a wee girl. Why can't I have a brandy? Oh. Alice. <laughs> I must imprint this scene upon my mind. It's all I'll have in the years to come, and you too, Alice. Oh, to think, Angus, you can come here whenever you want. Poor little Mordy. You think I'm silly? Of course I don't, my love. I think I'm a dull fellow. I am moved by cantilevers and concrete and not by names and faces. <laughs> Perhaps you should have married Angus here. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that the actor we saw last night at the gate? Eh? Alice, sit down. Oh, yes. Yes, there is Mr. George Grossmith. Yes, indeed. Lunching with Granville Barker, no less. Oh, dear, Alice. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> and if you care to glance at the, the table just beyond there, the one under the mirror, you will see in the flesh Sir Edward Carson, one of our most distinguished advocates. I find Lois rather tedious, frankly. Is that very naughty of me? See how she sparkles, oh. Angus. Eat up my precious, you've hardly touched your food. Oh, I know, I have the appetite of a little bird. Oh, I do wish we could have been a month <laughs> earlier. Then we could have been on the maiden voyage. Such a glittering assembly. Oh, Angus, such a swoony boat. But now we'll have to travel with the nouveau riche. It's so distressing. I did the best I could, my love. It was the rains that held us up. Well, they always do, you and your silly bridges. Why can't you build them in more convenient places? My pretty sweet, I build them in these places to make them more convenient. <laughs> do you understand? No, I don't. I'm only a woman and thinking gives me a headache. <laughs> Who's that man who looked at you when he went past Uncle Angus? Is he a friend? I have a friend looked like that at me once. I'd put honey in her hair. She had very long hair. She could sit on it. Angus? And the honey... Oh, all right. You're as white as a sheet. Are you feeling faint? I'll order you a glass of water. Boy, boy. Boy. Mother. Please, please, I, I'm all right. You see how he apes his betters? You knew he'd be here, didn't you? I did. Ah. Oh. The careless fellow had noted the reservation of his table on the telephone pad in his pantry. Why was the deceit necessary? If you'd known, you would not have come. No, I would not. No, you can't deny the evidence of your eyes. My eyes see a man lunching with what might well be a friend, a friend's wife and their daughter. You see your butler got up as a gentleman, mixing with people of superior social standing whom for one reason or another he wishes to impress. Can he afford to come here on what you pay him? In what other heinous ways does he gather Luca to his seamy bosom? You've allowed him too much license for too long. How else could I bring you to see, Richard, that fatal flaw in your character, that amiability which is no virtue but the worst of vices? Sorry they didn't elect you as a fellow of the Royal Society, Arthur. What? What a pleasant surprise to meet you here. Oh, yes, indeed, sir, a, a surprise. Won't you introduce me to your friends? Oh, indeed, sir, uh, Mr. Richard Bellamy, uh, Mrs. Hudson, my sister-in-law, Miss Alice Hudson, my niece, and Mr. Donald Hudson, my brother. How do you do? They are visiting London from the Malay States. May I join you for a moment? Oh, please, yes, oh, please like do. Mr. Bellamy, I would have known you anywhere from your photographs, so distinguished and so charming. I, I was so thrilled that Angus told us he worked for you, and I never knew. Sit down, Angus. I have the honor of knowing a distant relative of yours, a second cousin, I believe, a Miss Juanita Pringle. She is a little foreign, it's true, but... Oh, I'm quite overcome. London is so strong and draft. Are you here for long? No, we leave this very evening, alas, for the United States. Oh, we've had a wonderful time. I've been so very happy. Angus here knows everybody everywhere, and he has spent so much money on us. Money means nothing, I know. And now we've met you, Mr. Bellamy, and one is so cut off for most of one's life. Oh, the feeling is mutual. Uh, are you not the Donald Hudson who built that astounding bridge over the Zambezi? Oh, a bridge, yes. Astounding, I hope not. A bridge that astounded would fall down, I think. <laughs> this one merely stands, but it will stand forever, I hope. And are you not on your way to the Grand Canyon itself? Oh, we've heard about you, Mr. Hudson. Angus here keeps his secrets very well. He's a modest man. You've heard about his bridges? I'm honoured to have made your husband's acquaintance, Mrs. Hudson. You must be very proud of your brother, Angus. Well, I must go. I have a friend waiting for his lunch. It's been a great, great, great pleasure. Yes. Sit down, man, sit down. Oh, what a delightful person. Yes. Uncle Angus, do you work with him? I believe I'm plain speaking, Arthur. I do. Something plain to say to you. This has been a malicious and quite unnecessary act on your part. You can't speak to me like that when I'm taking you out to luncheon and I'm your host. I will speak to you as I wish. You are a bullying, self-righteous prig of a little boy, and you made my childhood a living hell. 
And if I hid behind my mother's skirts, it was because you were stronger than me. You were a physical coward then, as you are a moral coward now. And because you were trying to wrench my arm from its socket, which once you succeeded in doing. It was next. It was not. And on wet days, it still aches and reminds me of you, Arthur. <laughs> I am richer than you, I am happier. I am freer in my mind and in my attitudes than you. I make more effect upon the world and I spread less trouble about me. This is not to be tolerated. I shall take a cab to Liverpool Street and sit in the hotel until my train departs for Norwich. I'm indebted to you for putting me up. I do not think we shall see each other again. And neither do I. <laughs> 